To understand the need for a person-centered approach to providing long-term services and supports, we must understand person-centered systems and the federal context that is assisting in developing those systems. Here, we can see a timeline framing some of the events that took place that have contributed towards a more person-centered approach to service delivery and individual choice. One of the more well-known movements that happened early on is the Olmsted Act. Two women living with intellectual disabilities and mental illness wanted to transition from a nursing home to the community. The care teams surrounding and supporting both women were in complete agreement. Each woman could have her needs adequately met in the community. However, due to a limited number of slots within Georgia's Medicaid program for home and community-based services, each woman remained institutionalized long after their request for community placement. Both women sued the state of Georgia, alleging that failing to discharge them to a community-based setting was discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act. The case eventually made its way to the Supreme Court. In 1999, it was decided that the women had indeed been discriminated against. After the Olmstead Act, we can clearly see the progression of person-centered programs at both the state and federal levels. One of the very first actions taken by President George W. Bush was to sign the New Freedom Initiative, which clearly states that its main function is to help ensure that all Americans have the opportunity to live close to their families and friends, to live more independently, to engage in productive employment, and to participate in community life. So what do we mean when we talk about a person-centered system? At the core, person-centered systems are about the individual, their goals, and their desired outcomes. At the very base of person-centered systems, you will find a deliberate culture. This is a shared, deliberate set of assumptions shared by a group of people. In the context of this discussion, a deliberate culture would be exemplified by professionals in an organization understanding that all people in need of long-term services and supports have the right to access information concerning their options in care and supports. The second tier of person-centered systems would be espoused values. These are verbal expressions that come from the adoption of a deliberate culture. Using a person's name instead of resident is an example of an espoused value. When assisting people with long-term support needs, asking them about their preferences, strengths, capacities, needs, and desired outcomes is a perfect example of an espoused value. The third uppermost tier concerning person-centered systems is represented by artifacts. Artifacts are actions that demonstrate the deliberate culture and the espoused values of an organization. Concerning the support of persons in need of long-term services and supports, the delivery of services in a manner that respects the individual's preferences is an artifact in that the service providers are demonstrating their willingness to partner with the individual to meet their unique needs and reach their own stated goals. Providers are espousing their values and shared assumptions in asking the individual about his or her preferences, and then are demonstrating an artifact by making every effort to respond to those needs. When we are able to utilize these three tiers in creating a person-centered system, we are able to shift from a methodology of service delivery that focuses on a menu of services to a focus on informal supports, individualized choices and goals, and a process of planning that promotes trust, cooperation, and creativity. This creativity, trust, and focus on individual goals are all key factors in supporting and assisting individuals in need of long-term services and supports to achieve his or her personal goals. One of the challenging aspects to this shift in culture comes when many professionals feel that a person-centered approach means that the individual gets all of their needs met and they fear they are setting the person up for disappointment or failure. A person-centered approach helps us to better understand the individual's strengths, needs, goals, and values to help design a support plan that responds to the individual's desires. There are a number of problem-solving methods that we can learn by following a person-centered approach. Let's talk about Ruth, a woman living in a nursing home. Ruth is no longer capable of living at home, though she greatly desires to return to her community. Instead of asking Ruth if she would like to learn about her options for potentially returning to the community, we could ask Ruth instead what makes home a true home. We can ask Ruth about the garden she used to have, and we can talk with Ruth about how she loved to bake, and about how she loved the smell of laundry that had been dried outside in the sunshine. 
By having this conversation before jumping to talking about living arrangements for Ruth, we're not only learning what would make Ruth happier, we're connecting with her, building trust, and are able to learn more about who Ruth is as a person. Now we can take steps to create a living environment that respects Ruth's values and reflects what home really means to her. Ultimately, this process is an excellent example of New Hampshire's movement towards a more person-centered system. By asking an individual directly for their preferences, and then by acknowledging those preferences and initiating the service planning process, we're able to support the individual's personal goals. One of the most important responsibilities that we have as service professionals is to provide the individuals we serve with as much choice and control as possible. By adopting a person-centered culture, and by demonstrating this culture, we are celebrating the unique attributes of the individuals that we support.